morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. Our scripture lesson this morning is from the Gospel of Matthew in the 22nd chapter, beginning in the 34th verse. Hearing that Jesus had silenced the Sadducee, the Pharisee got together. One of them, an expert in the law, tested him with a question. Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? Jesus replied, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. The second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. While the Pharisee were gathered together, Jesus asked them, What do you think about the Messiah? Whose son is he? The son of David, they replied. He said to them, How is it then that David, speaking by the Spirit, calls him Lord? For he says, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I put your enemies under your feet. If then David calls him Lord, how can he be his son? No one could say a word in reply. And from that day on, no one dared ask him any more questions. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Pray with me, please. Lord, speak. Use me if you will, or move me out of the way. Just speak into the hearts of your people, for you are our rock and our salvation. Amen. Amen. Today, we complete our three-part series on answering our call. And as Fidel's mentioned, Karen started us off with her Laity Sunday message from Romans 8, urging us to share the story of God's love with our neighbors and our community. Last week, we explored giving to God what is God's, and that includes doing what God calls us to do. This week, we continue in Matthew's Gospel with a story that, to me anyway, is the essence of living the Christian life. Just as last week, today we are still on the Monday of Holy Week. Yesterday, Jesus rode into town on Palm Sunday on the donkey. Loud hosannas and praise for Jesus. And today has been one argument after another. With the religious leaders, the Roman partisans in Jerusalem, and on this day, I imagine Jesus feels a little bit like that lone lawman in the Western, right? In the lawless town, he's the one voice of reason and righteousness in the midst of all of this. It's an all-day-long affair with the accusatory questions. First, the Pharisees come after him, demanding to know, on what authority do you do the things that you do? Next, they try to trap him with the Romans, as we discussed last week. Having struck out, the Sadducees are up. And just before this passage, they enter the frame and they ask a question about the resurrection. If someone was married to several brothers in this life, whose is she in the resurrection? And Jesus points out that they don't know what they're talking about. See, the Sadducees are another Jewish sect, like the Pharisees. But the Sadducees believe only the first five books of the Bible are authoritative. So they don't believe any of the prophets, any of the Psalms, any of the history, anything else. And they don't believe in the resurrection, which leads them to their question and leads them to be called the Sadducees because they don't believe in the resurrection because they're sad, you see. Uh -huh. <laughs> so they set out to trap Jesus on their turf. And once again, Jesus refuses to wander in. And this gives the Pharisees time to regroup. They return in today's lesson and notice they're still testing, still poking, still trying to get under Jesus' skin. Some translations say that a lawyer asks the questions. I want you to understand if you read that, that's not talking about a lawyer like in court, a criminal lawyer. 
I like the translation that we have here better, an expert in the law. In other words, someone who knows the Jewish law inside and out, thoroughly mastered it over years of study. Now remember, these are the Pharisees. These are the ones who believe you have to follow every bit of the law perfectly. There are 613 commands in the Hebrew Scriptures. 248 of them say, do this. 365 of them say, don't do that. And you have to, according to the Pharisees, follow every single one of them perfectly in order to be righteous. So the trap here is to get Jesus to isolate one part of Scripture, just one commandment out of the 613 so that the Pharisees can say, oh, you picked the wrong one. Clearly, you're not an authoritative Jewish leader. So they try to trap him by asking, what is the greatest commandment? Earl Palmer has an interesting observation. This has been a day of nothing but conflict for Jesus, right? And one fight after another with everyone that he's been dealing with. But here comes this expert in the law asking this trick question. There's lots of different ways Jesus could have gone with this. The expert could have been trying to trap Jesus in an unanswerable question like the Pharisees did last week. He could be trying to prove that Pharisees just plain ask better questions than the Sadducees do. We're smarter. But he could actually be wondering what the right answer is. What does God actually expect of me? Palmer notes, it's interesting that Jesus takes the most gracious interpretation. He honors the courage that it would have taken to ask that question from a genuine heart and answers genuinely himself. And I think there's a lesson for us there. That we can approach Jesus with absolutely anything that's on our hearts. We can trust our God to respond exactly with what we need to be told, in this case, about the love of God. Jesus' response is masterful. He says two things which have become known as the great commandment. And let's look at each. In verse 37, Jesus says, Jesus replied, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This comes from Deuteronomy 6. He is quoting from Hebrew scripture. And it's the second part of what is known as the Shema. It is the daily prayer that every observant Jew offers morning and evening. The Shema holds a similar place in Judaism as the Lord's Prayer does for us. It's that anchoring kind of a prayer. Now, interestingly, Mark tells us the same story. And in Mark's version, the, it, the quote begins with the first part of the Shema. Shema means hear in Hebrew. And it's taken from the first word in the Hebrew, Shema Yisrael, Adonai Elohenu, Adonai Chad. Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God, the Lord is one. And then comes this part that Jesus quotes, Be'ahavta et Adonai Elcha, Be'chol Lechavka, U'evchol Nafshecha, U'evchol Me'odeka. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your mind. This, the Shema, is the first command that Moses gives the people in Deuteronomy to know God and to love God entirely. 
I love the unity, the completeness in this. We are to love God, love God entirely with everything we have. Boy, that's not easy some days, is it? I know there are some days when my heart isn't entirely on God. I suspect I'm not alone. But Jesus says, this is the first and greatest commandment. Why? Well, think about it. If you believe in God, what can you possibly put ahead of God? Nothing, right? I mean, it just doesn't make sense. But we do. We make idols out of our work, out of our net worth, the number on a scale, whatever. There's something that we put ahead of God on a regular basis. We might pay lip service to God. We might make weekend visits. But the custody of our hearts the rest of the week, who has those? Does God, or do we give them over to the world? Let's turn to the second thing that Jesus says in verse 39. He says, and the second is like it, love your neighbor as yourself. This is coming from Leviticus. This is a quote from Leviticus 19, 18. Do not seek revenge or bear a grudge against anyone among your people, but love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. Notice this. In Leviticus, this comes in the midst of a string of commands that God gives the people on how they are to live as God's people. I think that's significant. We first learn how to relate to God. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. Then we learn how God expects us to relate to one another. Where else do we see this pattern? Let's take a look at the Ten Commandments. We can find that same pattern at work there. The first four commandments are all about how God wants us to relate to God. Have no other God. Don't make idols in your life. Don't misuse my name. Honor the Sabbath. The other six are all about how God wants us to relate to one another. Honor your parents. Don't murder. Don't commit adultery. Don't steal. Don't lie. Don't take your neighbor's stuff. All the law and prophets hang on these. Jesus is saying the essence of the Ten Commandments, indeed the essence of the whole 613 commandments of the law, can be summed up in these two things. Love God. Love others. That's it. It all comes down to this. Now, I have to acknowledge, Jesus may be working here from something that would have been familiar to his Jewish listeners of the day. This might not have been Jesus' unique words. Patrick Gray observes that about 20 years before Jesus, the famed Jewish rabbi Hillel the Elder is reported to have said, That which is hateful to you, do not do to your fellow man. That is the whole of Torah. The rest is commentary. I want you to notice something, too, in verse 39, where Jesus says, And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. The second is like it. It's like it. It's not the same. There's not an equivalence between them. One has to come first. But there's a similarity, and they're closely bound. So how is it that they are tied together? How is it that they are bound? Friends, it's love. John understood this. In 1 John 4, we find the reminder that we love because he first loved us. In other words, God loves. 
loves unconditionally. At some part in our lives, we came to realize that love extends to each of us, which is why we're here today. But love isn't fully realized as love unless it's returned. I remember being in seventh grade and spending the whole of seventh grade pining for Cindy DeSormo, who didn't even know I existed, I'm sure. It doesn't become love until it's returned. It doesn't become all it's meant to be until it's returned. In other words, until I found Mary. I would make the argument that the whole of the Bible revolves around these two thoughts. God is love. And God loves us, loved us first. Loved us enough to create us, to want you to be here. And we had a choice. We could accept God's love and follow God and be with God, or we could say, no thanks. Humanity as a whole has chosen to say, no thanks. You're the ones who have accepted God's invitation. And when we come to recognize that love and return that love, when we love God with all our heart and soul and mind and strength, it gets pretty all-inclusive, doesn't it? We're meant to love God with our whole being. So what does it look like for us here at Silverbrook to love God with our whole being? To be honest, in some ways I'm still figuring this out for myself, but I know this. It means more than just a hurried prayer in the morning or at bedtime. It means more than just an hour on Sunday mornings. It means a life of discipleship, being willing to follow God wherever God is leading. It means putting God first. It means being open to what it is that God may be asking me to do and then, surprise, doing it. It means asking where God is already at work in our neighborhood. It means asking who God is trying to love and then loving them. Yes, the hard to love ones. Yes, the ones who don't look like me, dress like me, live like me. Yes, the ones who reject me who reject God, all of them, all our neighbors, all our beloved children of God, and our job is at once unbelievably simple and incredibly difficult to just love them. You see how the love of God and love of neighbor are intertwined like that? Because as we're filled with that love, we feel like we're bursting with it. We need to share it. We need to pass it on. And so we reach out in love to those around us. Love is only love when it's shared. When it's the dynamic between two people. Love isn't love if it's bottled up inside. And the same is true here. God is calling us to be God's love for our neighbors here in Lorton. But as George Buttrick observed, it's not just love of God and love of neighbor. And I want you to see something else in here. We are to love God. Yep, absolutely. We are to love neighbor, but how? Love your neighbor as yourself. We love our neighbors because we recognize the same image of God that lives in me, lives in you. You are a beloved child of God. 
and you, and you, and you, and you. We are all beloved children of God. And we love because he first loved us. That's the good news for you and me. That's the good news for Silverbrook, the good news for Lorton, and the challenge for us. How do we take the love of God that we've found and share it with our neighbors? If we love God, how can we show it by our love of neighbor? We can learn from what others around us are doing. Buckhall UMC, out toward Manassas, isn't much bigger than we are. And to express the love of God, to reach out to their community, they took a sunny portion of their grounds and turned it into a community garden. Neighbors can come and plant, and Buckhall can engage with them, build relationships, connect, and draw them into the love of God through love of neighbor. We have people running the county trail that runs right through our parking lot. We have people walking and jogging past our doors every day. Every Sunday, I get to see them as they're going by through the windows out there. How could we connect with the trail walkers, the dog walkers, and share with them God's love? Over the next few weeks, I want to hear what God is putting on your hearts. Ways in which we could welcome the families that will go into the eight new homes being built right next door. And ways we could make the love of God known in Lord. Over 40 years ago, there's a little short movie made called The Music Box. And it tells the story of a man in a really depressed neighborhood who comes upon this music box. And when he opens it, it plays the most beautiful music he's ever heard. His soul is touched and warmed for the first time by the beauty of this sound. And he takes the music box, and he takes it home with him, and he hides it. He hides it because he just doesn't think his wife or his kids or his family or his neighbors would understand what it means to him. Over the course of this little movie, he becomes aware that the music box isn't his. It's meant to be shared. Friends, we have been given an amazing gift the gift of God's love and grace. And all God expects in return is two things. To love God with all that we are and to love each other as beloved children of God. Christianity isn't really that complicated. It all comes down to this. For God's greater glory. As Shelby returns to lead us in our offering, let me invite you to please turn to number 95 in your books, and we will have the doxology put together. <laughs> We have now come to the time in our service where the word has been read and proclaimed and we respond as faithful members of the body of Christ. We have collected these tithes and gifts and now dedicate them to the Lord. As we do, we thank God for all that God first gave us out of God's unconditional love. Let us pray. Uh, dear Lord, we are entering that time of year where people gather and have good meals and are surrounded by family and joy. As we go into the holidays, we also understand that others will struggle and that people may be missing that were there before. We hope that these gifts and tithes find their way to those who are struggling and support them through the holiday season. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Thank you. 
Concluding hymn of response is number 569. Please stand.